So Luke chapter 15, before we read the story of the prodigal son, let's read the first three verses. So Luke chapter 15, verse 1 to verse 3. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. And then we'll move on to verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The son came home, the father welcomed him back, and they all lived happily ever after. I mean, that's basically how this story seems to be ending, isn't it? It seems like Jesus is winding down, and verse 24 seems to be the perfect ending. You can imagine if this was a movie or a TV program, the camera would pan out from the dinner table, they'd all be laughing, they'd all be smiling, and then the credits would start to roll. It's a perfect ending. And yet, Jesus doesn't finish this story where we would expect him to finish. He takes what seems to be this perfect finale and he smashes it before our eyes. Just as we have that lovely, warm feeling inside, Jesus takes it away and he gives us the chills. And so the question we have to ask why does Jesus seem to ruin a perfectly good story? Why doesn't Jesus finish with verse 24? And the answer is, there is something about this older son that we desperately need to hear. 
And so this morning we want to focus in on this final scene and we want to see this older brother. But before we do that, uh, those of you who were watching last week, do you remember what our theme was as we thought about the younger son? We thought about how you could sum this character up with two words, rebellion and ruin. Well, if you look at the older son, he looks completely different. And yet, if you were to scratch underneath the surface, you would see that there is something just as tragic about this son as there is about his brother. And I think the two words that sum up the older brother, it's not rebellion and ruin, but religion and ruin. So let's come and see this final scene. Now, I wonder, whenever we read this story, did you feel at least a little bit sorry for the older brother? The younger son, he's been out having the time of his life. He's been drinking, he's been dancing, he's been pouring the father's hard-earned money down the drain. What about the older son? He's been working. He's been getting his hands dirty. He's been doing what he's told. And really, that sums this older son up in a nutshell. He was a model worker. He's the sort of guy who would never be late to work. He would never take a sick day. He would never do sloppy work. He's someone the father can trust 100% to always get the job done. This older son, he couldn't be more different from that ungrateful swine of a younger brother, could he? And yet... When the father throws a party, who does he throw it for? Not the guy who's been working morning and night. Not the guy who's never let him down. But the guy whose life has been an absolute disaster. And so, it's easy to feel sorry for this older son. It's easy to imagine how he would have felt as he walked in from the field after another long shift and he heard all this music. It's easy to imagine the anger and the indignation as he hears about who's come back home. His reaction seems to be perfectly natural. If we had worked as hard as he had, and if we had never been given a party by the father, we would be every bit as upset whenever we hear all this music. In verse 28, this older son, he's so angry he won't even go inside. And there is something inside of us that wants to jump to his defence. But before we do, we need to remember what the point is of this story. Jesus is teaching us what God is like. He is showing us that God is a gracious God, but he's also showing us that there is a right way and a wrong way to respond to God's grace. And so this morning we need to see that older son through that lens. And if we really want to get to the bottom of things, we have to actually go back to verse 1 to verse 3. Verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners... We're all gathering around to hear Jesus. Do you remember a few weeks ago we thought about tax collectors? We thought about how they're basically gangsters, they're racketeers, and they made people's lives an absolute misery. And here is Jesus, and what's he doing? He is openly speaking with and associating with people just like this. The scum of the earth, the lowest of the low. And so unsurprisingly, verse 2 the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. It's no surprise that they're not impressed. And then in verse 3 we're told, Then Jesus told them this parable. And that word then is very significant because that word tells us that this parable we're looking at and the other parables in chapter 15 they are part of Jesus' response to these Pharisees and teachers of the law. And so whenever you see that, it's actually not terribly difficult to work out who this story is all about. This lost son, the prodigal son, he's a picture of these sinners that Jesus is spending time with. 
People who have made a complete and utter disaster of their lives. People who are about as far away from God as you can possibly imagine. And Jesus is showing us that even people like this are not lost causes. Even people like this can experience God's incredible grace and incredible restoration if they repent. The sinners are the younger son. But here's the thing. If these so-called sinners are the younger son, and if God is the father in the story, then who is the older son supposed to be? Well, he's the Pharisees, isn't he? Good, decent, upright people. Religious people who knew their Bibles inside out. People who never, ever missed a church service. Dare I say, people who are very much like some of you watching this morning. And the message that Jesus is giving in this story, it's really, really clear. And maybe it's a message that some of you need to hear this morning. Religion can lead to ruin. And you can see how this older son's a really good picture of the Pharisees, can't you? They're both exceptionally hardworking. They both live disciplined, frugal lives. They're both absolutely committed to doing the right thing. You can imagine that both the Pharisees and this older brother, they had the same sort of reputations. You can imagine maybe the father going to market, and as soon as his back's turned, people are talking all about this younger son who cleared off and took all the money. But they never had a single bad thing to say about the older son who stayed at home. And the Pharisees were like that. They were absolutely beyond reproach. They were the most meticulous, most religious, most committed people you could possibly imagine. No one had a bad word to say about them. And of course those are all good things. It's good that this son was hard working. It's good that he was reliable. It's good that the Pharisees were so committed to doing the right thing. But this story has a sting in the tail. Because as well as seeing the religion of the son, Jesus wants us to see his ruin. And the picture that Jesus paints for us here really isn't pretty. Notice that this older son is angry in verse 28. Notice the sharpness in his voice in verse 29. You, know, you can almost imagine the contempt dripping from his tongue as he speaks. Notice how defensive he is. I've never disobeyed your orders. Notice how emotionally this son's in a really bad place. He can't enjoy the music. He can't enjoy the food. He can't sit back and take an evening off. There is something inside him and it's eating him up. I mean, just, just think of the really negative character traits that we see in this son. He's resentful. He just can't stand the idea of his brother being back. Everybody else is overjoyed. He's sick to the stomach. He's judgmental. Notice what he says in verse 30. This son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes. Well, this younger son certainly had squandered the father's money. There may well have been prostitutes involved, we're not told. But even if this older son is right, and there's no evidence that he necessarily is right, he's so judgmental, isn't he? This son of yours. He makes it clear that even if the father welcomes him back, that's something he is never going to do. He's not welcome. This older son is ungrateful. Verse 29. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And we know that's not fair. We know that this father is loving and he's generous. We know that he gives his sons 
everything they could possibly need, and yet the only thing that this guy can focus on isn't what he's been given, it's what he hasn't been given. And he's built up this narrative, it's entirely within his own head, and it's eating him up. And maybe most of all, under the surface, the older son is frightened, isn't he? He's frightened that if the father has welcomed the younger son home, then there is going to be less for him. He's frightened that if the younger son is back in the good books, then he's going to lose his special place. He's terrified that all of his hard work, all of his sweat, all of his tears, they might not be worth as much as he thought. He's resentful, he's judgmental, he's ungrateful, he's frightened. Now he may not be in a pigsty, he may not have lost all of his money, but he's ruined, isn't he? He just happens to be ruined in a different way. And I wonder how many religious people are just like this. Outwardly they have everything together, their kids are well turned out, their jobs are respectable, they're well thought of in the community, and yet inside they're judgmental, they're resentful, and they're frightened. That was certainly the case with the Pharisees. But Jesus directs us in this story to look closer to home. And surely, if you were to look at an average church in Ireland, you'll find people who are just like this. I wonder how many people watching right now have been ruined by religion. Jesus is telling us here it's a very real danger. So what's the lesson? Am I saying this morning that religion is a bad thing? Well, well, no, of course I'm not. See, the problem with the Pharisees is how they viewed religion. More specifically, it's how they viewed God. And that is exactly the same problem that so many people in Ireland have today. And Jesus does an incredible job in this story of illustrating this wrong view of God. We see it in verse 29. Notice what the son says. All these years I've been slaving for you. How can he possibly use a word like that? We know the father's gracious. We know he's compassionate. And yet this older son seems to think he's some sort of tyrant. In fact, he doesn't treat him as a father. He treats him like a slave driver. Look at the verse again. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. You men who are fathers, you love to make your children happy, don't you? I've got a son and I love putting a smile on his face and I love doing it for no other reason than I can. I just love to see him happy. And I know that there are some really bad fathers out there, but any father who is even remotely worthy of the title just loves to lavish kindness on his children. But notice how this son has completely twisted the concept of fatherly kindness and he's turned it into something that is dependent on following orders. He thinks that the secret to being loved by the father is to do more stuff. He thinks if I can just work as hard as I possibly can, then I can earn the father's love. And and that's why he's so disgusted by this party. You see, if the father has welcomed the younger son home, if the father has lavished him with kindness, even though he hasn't deserved it, well then his entire view of the world has been turned on its head. This older son, he doesn't work hard because he loves the father. He doesn't even work hard because the father knows best. He works hard 
because he thinks this is the most effective route to getting what he wants. And now that he's seen that there is another way to get what he wants, he feels like he's been wasting his time. What is the point in working my socks off if this fellow can just come in here, he can clear off, he can blow everything and then he can be welcomed back home? And you know, you can imagine, some of those Pharisees who were listening to this, you can imagine what it would have been like whenever the penny dropped. Imagine when they worked out that Jesus is talking about them. Imagine how angry they would have been. Imagine how their faces would have turned red. Jesus really hits a nerve. So many people view God in exactly this way. And that's the point of this last scene. Jesus is supposed to be hitting a nerve. Because who is this older brother? He's not just the Pharisees, is he? He's you. Or at least, he might be you. You can be a good, decent respectable person. You can even be a religious person. You can be at every church service. You can subscribe to multiple churches on YouTube and yet you can have completely the wrong idea about God. You can see him as an employer who needs to be impressed rather than a father who lavishes his sons with grace. I wonder, is that you? And if it is you, I wonder can you see some of the ruin in your life? Jesus is giving you a warning in this passage. You need to listen. It's not about what you do. It's not about what you deserve. It's about the grace of the Father. Now maybe you're watching this morning and you're not a Christian. And one of the reasons you're not a Christian is you're really, really put off by how judgmental and how bitter many Christians can be. Well, do you see from this story, that is not what Christianity is all about. In fact, Jesus is telling us here, many of those people who are such a turnoff, they may be religious but they're not actually Christians. Because if they were Christians, they would realise it's all about grace. They would realise it's all about what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And their resentments and their arrogance would completely melt away. Jesus is telling us they haven't got it. Or maybe this morning, you do get all of that. You do understand it's all about grace. You do understand it's not about what we deserve or what we earn. But you're still not sure if the gospel's for you. Well, there's one final warning that I need to make. You see, this older son, his view of God ruined him in many, many ways. But actually, I haven't mentioned yet the most serious way in which it ruined this son. And this is why you really, really need to take the grace of God seriously. Notice what's happening here. The father throws this enormous party. The younger son, he's welcomed in with open arms. But the older son stays outside. You know, it's really tragic. This story ends... And it's not happily ever after. There's an enormous rift between two of the characters. Between father and son. And the rift, of course, it's not because of the father. The father does everything he possibly can. He comes out. He pleads with the son. He begs him to come in and be a part of the celebration. But the older son won't budge. And do you notice why? Verse 29. Look, 
all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You see, this man, he doesn't miss out in spite of his hard work. He doesn't miss out even though he's good and decent and religious. He misses out because of his religion. His hard work and his decency are the very things that leave him in the cold. His religion stops him from understanding grace. So let me say to you as we finish, your hard work is good. Your uprightness is good. Your decency is good. But as good as those things may be, if they get in the way of you and grace, they'll ruin you. Not just now, but into eternity. Because that is what this party is picturing. It's God's grace forever and ever in heaven. Let me say to all of you, Whether you've done this before or whether you haven't, let go of what you've done. Don't bring what you've done into the equation at all. Go to the one who shows grace. Go to the loving father. Go to the one who doesn't just give a robe. He doesn't just give sandals. He doesn't just give a fattened calf. Go to the one who gives something much, much better. Go to the one who gives the very best he has. Go to the one who has given his only begotten son so that he could die, so you could become part of the family. And who knows, maybe some of you watching this morning will do that today. For the very first time. What a wonderful day this would be. Imagine. Imagine what the reaction would be in heaven. As you experience the grace of God for the very first time. Verse 32. We had to celebrate. You were dead and are alive again. You were lost and are found.